Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this distinguished author series event featuring Richard Haas, President of the Council of Foreign Relations, and author of A World in Disarray, American Foreign and Policy and the Crisis of the Old Order. I'm happy to say that this is Richard's third appearance as a distinguished author here. The first time was in July of 2009 for his book, War of Necessity, War of Choice, a memoir of two Iraq wars, written out of his experience of working in both Bush administrations and therefore during both Iraq wars. He came to IPI a second time in June 2013 for his book, Foreign Policy Begins at Home, The Case for Putting America's House in Order, written out of concern that America was embarking on ambitious efforts to remake societies and foster institutions in remote places without attending to the neglected and weakened institutions at home, whose deterioration he felt undermined American leadership in the world. Uh, as he put it, then, in his talk here, America was overreaching abroad and underperforming at home. This new book was published in 2017 and then updated last year with a new afterward to accommodate a transformative development that Richard could not foresee when he first wrote the book, the election of Donald Trump, and how it exacerbated the movement already in the works away from the liberal world order, much of it inspired and sustained by the West, and towards disorder, producing what Richard calls in the title, a world in disarray. In the book, he proposes a new operating system, or as he puts it, World Order 2.0, which has major implications for, among other things, the practice of multilateral diplomacy as we know it in this community and as we promote it here at IPI. Richard is not by nature an alarmist, but there is a lot of alarm sounding in the book. Uh, I go to the council frequently, and a favorite phrase of Richard's these days is, quote, if you're not worried, you're probably not paying attention. <laughs> Uh, Richard has to leave early tonight, but he has signed copies of his book in advance. They are for sale at the door, and since they are paperback, the price is right. <laughs> On a personal note, I've known Richard for more than 20 years now. Uh, first, as a friend sharing gossip and the occasional substantive comment, walking the summertime beaches of Martha's Vineyard. Then, as the Bush administration official... Uh, I dealt with when I was the New York Times correspondent covering the Northern Ireland peace talks. And in recent years, as I have been an active member and sometimes participant at the Council on Foreign Relations, where Richard has been the president now for 15 years. These days, he is a virtual zealot of foreign affairs commentary, uh, popping up everywhere in print and on television and at all hours as the matinal members of this audience who watch Morning Joe can attest to. Finally, in addition to being his friend, I am also his great admirer, and I'm really delighted that he has made his way here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Richard Haas. After that generous and uh, comprehensive introduction, besides saying thank you, uh, we, could, we could probably go straight to questions, because uh, Warren has left very little to the, uh, to the imagination. So this is his way of repaying me for what he said you know, he, when he was the New York Times guy in London. What he was basically saying is I was a good source. And uh, so this is now come around. Uh, you're great sports to be here tonight. Either that, or you all really need to get a life and <laughs> find something to do that's fun uh, in New York on a, on a Wednesday night when it's snowing or something. But uh, anyhow, thank you for, for braving the, um, the mean streets 
of the, uh, of the big city here, which is the greatest city in the world, even if the sports teams uh, don't quite uh, live up to that. And, uh, but I digress. Uh, so how, how long would you like to be talk for? Um, 15? 15 we can do. Uh, look, I wrote this book, as Warren suggested, before I knew who was going to be the 45th president of the United States. You know, an incoming president can choose a lot, can choose his or her running mate, his or her platform, ultimately his or her cabinet. The one thing he or she cannot choose is the inbox. And the inbox essentially is, is set. And I thought that the 45th president was going to inherit a really demanding inbox for lots of reasons. One was uh, a lot of the institutions that had been created after uh, World War II, they were, they were getting on. And a you know, few of us who uh, turned 70 uh, are what we were when we were 20 or 30, and that was true of the institutions that were created after World War II. I mean, here we are across the street from the UN. Not one of you would design a UN Security Council that looks like this one <laughs> if you uh, were starting from scratch. Inconceivable, both who's there and who's not there. You just wouldn't do it. But this is the only Security Council we've got, and uh, despite several of you who are probably writing your doctoral dissertations on how to change it, ain't going to happen. <laughs> uh, so there's, you know, there's that, and other, other institutions as well. In some cases, the institutions didn't exist. Think about it. We just went through the, the process of NAFTA after 25, 30 years becoming what we call the USMCA in this country. Put Donald Trump's views on trade aside, NAFTA had hit a, was inadequate in certain areas. One of them was digital commerce. There wasn't digital commerce when NAFTA had been originally uh, negotiated under 41's presidency and then when it was ratified, locked into law under uh, Bill Clinton's. Or think about issues like uh, cyber governance. There wasn't cyber. Think about issues like climate change. There was no international consciousness about climate change 70, 70 years ago. There may not be enough now, but that's another story. Uh, but So a lot of the machinery, either because it didn't anticipate the agenda, power balance, this has changed. China, in 1945, when a lot of these institutions were created, China was just basically resuming its civil war. Civil war went on till 1949. China didn't have you know, even a a modicum of an economy till the Maoist era was over. And again, fun fundamental changes in absolute and relative balances. And any statistic you can think of, uh, this world is unrecognizable. Uh, so there's that. You also had in the last uh, few years before this president took over, you had the revival of great power rivalry. We can have a conversation as to why. <laughs> to some extent structural reasons, the question of China's rise and to what extent it would be accommodated. Xi, uh, Xi Jinping does represent, I think, some important departures from Deng Xiaoping and his philosophy of China's role in the region and the uh, world. You have a very alienated, to put it mildly, the, uh, you know, the other word would be cranky, Russia, which essentially is an outlier and, wants outlier and had no interest in being integrated into the, the so-called liberal uh, world order. You had, uh, because of globalization, uh, the production of all sorts of capacities in more hands than ever before, to use a tired metaphor. You know, we think of the far international relations as taking place on a chessboard. Well, there aren't enough pieces to take into account this chessboard, this era of history, whether it's countries with capacity, nine countries with nuclear weapons, uh, but dozens of countries with meaningful conventional weapons, and then groups like uh, Hezbollah, and Hamas, and ISIS, and Al-Qaeda. And then you've got benign actors like uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, or um, Doctors Without uh, Borders, or, or what have you, that we, or, or corporations, you know, the CNNs, uh, global media empires. You, you had a, again, uh, to the extent there is any governance in the world, it had been far outpaced by the emergence of all sorts of entities, states and non-states, that had capacity to make a difference. And politics and governance hadn't caught up with it. So for all these reasons, whoever was the 45th president was going to inherit, I think, a world where the centrifugal forces were pretty pronounced. 
And then uh, I think the United States is the other big factor in that. Um, as Warren you know, was mentioned in one of my previous books, I do think that we had in the United States uh, a reaction against what was widely perceived as overreach. First in, um, yeah, I say most in the 2003 Iraq War, uh, but then in, in other in Afghanistan, uh, which never seemed to wind down, in Libya and so forth. So you had a, a domestic pushback. The phrase lots of people use, I think it was a pretty good phrase, was intervention fatigue. But a real sense of uh, we were doing too much. Even though, by the way, the percentage of GDP the United States is spending on defense is roughly half now that it was during the Cold War. <laughs> so it's not that you couldn't have guns and butter, but psychologically and politically, the sense was we were doing way too much abroad. And I think a bigger part of it was because the th people sensed that things weren't right here at home. Uh, all you have to do is go to Kennedy Airport and to prove my point, uh, or take you know, the L train, uh, American infrastructure, F train, there you go. Uh, but American infrastructure is not what it used to be. People line up at American consulates around the world, maybe to go to Harvard or Stanford. They do not line up to go to America's inner city public schools. We've got a real K through 12 uh, problem in this, uh, in this country. The amount of legislation we pass at the federal level now is a fraction of what it, it used to be. Uh, it's one thing to have checks and balances. It's something qualitatively different to have gridlock and political dis dysfunctionality. And long ago, we went from checks and balances into gridlock and, and into the truly dysfunctional. So you have uh, real problems in the United, States, and I, the United States. And I think in the Obama presidency, the 44th president, you had both overreach in places like Libya but also then underreach. Libya is actually an example of both. First, we went in, I think, unnecessarily, and then we never followed it up, as though order was magically going to result after we removed authority uh, there. Needless to say, it did not. The Syrian debacle. And so you, you had then a Middle East that was truly uh, had unraveled, and where the map, what Mr. Rand and Mr. McNally produced, bore almost no relationship to what has grown up in the... Uh, in the Middle East. So this is, this is essentially you know, the context in which I wrote the book. And what I would essentially say is that over the last two years, virtually none of this has been reversed for the better. And if anything, it has been dramatically exacerbated. And I think you have in, in place a president who came into office, and I know this because I spent time with him during the campaign. I had my 15 minutes of fame during the campaign when Mr. Trump was asked in one of the debates, where do you go for foreign policy understanding? And he said, uh, the guy I talked to is Richard Haas. Uh, and we had talked, uh, you know, we knew each other from golf and we had talked, uh, we had spent an hour together one day at, at the tower and then he saw me on Morning Joe with a degree of frequency and per perhaps, but anyhow, but he believed and believes two things passionately. One is that America's gotten a raw deal out of trade, and therefore trade is essentially a ripoff. And we, uh, and that, secondly, that America's alliances, and more broadly, our global involvement cost a lot more than it benefited us. That essentially the game wasn't worth the candle, that we were being played for suckers by allies. And more broadly, he didn't see the connection between what was going on in the world, for better and for worse, and the quality of life here. And the, you know, he liked my book, Foreign Policy Begins at Home, but I once reminded him, uh, Donald, foreign policy begins at home, it doesn't end at home. Uh, <laughs> but um, my influence, shall we say, was finite, which is why I'm speaking with you here tonight. And see, there's a bright side to everything. And I would say that over the last two years, you know, I can talk about some of the positive things of his foreign policy. I think for his, just to mention one, which is very much in the news, his putting a spotlight on what China has done in the economic realm, I think, has been quite salutary. Uh, the hopes that WTO membership would, would get China to become a, a very different place uh, in its behavior economically, domestic, politically, and the rest has not uh, been borne out whatsoever. So I think it is time for a reset of the U.S.-China uh, uh, relationship. But in many cases, I'm quite critical of the foreign policy, and I think it's raised fundamental questions about American reliability, about American uh, predictability, 
And what's happening is countries, two, two things are beginning to happen. One is countries are beginning to take matters more into their own hands. We're seeing that in places like Saudi Arabia, we're seeing that in South Korea. And we're seeing countries uh, defer less to the United States. So American influence is, is, is going uh, down. We're seeing spaces created in the Middle East and elsewhere that others beginning to, to fill, whose agendas, shall I say, are not very friendly to our uh, interests. And in some cases, you're probably going to see countries deferring to strong neighbors, whether it's a China or others. And you're also seeing some uh, malign actors, or actors who choose to act malign in certain circumstances, uh, beginning to act more so, whether it's Russia uh, in parts of Europe or the, uh, or the Middle East, or Iran with its imperial reach and so forth, uh, China and the South China uh, Sea. So we're beginning to see more assertive, I'll use a generous word, diplomatic word, behavior on the part of uh, many actors. Uh, you're beginning to see relationships fray, because again, America is not uh, predictable, not as uh, reliable. What we're emphasizing in relationships is more burden sharing than, than obligation uh, sharing. And what, so what we're beginning to see around the world is a, uh, a very different dynamic, much less emphasis on uh, shared responsibilities, much less emphasis on human rights, democracy, and, and, and values, much less emphasis on institutions. Mr. Trump is not an isolationist, but he is a large unilateralist, and he is very anti-institutional. Whether the institutions are the WTO, or treaties like the JCPOA with uh, or, or Iran, institutions, uh, uh, alliances, the, the migration compact, you, 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 could, you can go around uh, the Paris Agreement. And what he wants to do is maintain uh, tremendous flexibility and, uh, and basically autonomy for the United States. And I would just simply say this is incompatible with many of the precepts or foundations of American foreign policy over the last uh, 70 years. And I just make two last points, and then I'll stop. Uh, I see more an assault on the basics of American foreign policy than I do a substitute, almost like health care. Uh, more going after Obamacare than replacing it. I see a lot of the foreign policy equivalent to that, that we know what we're against. It's not as clear what we are for. And I would say that without the United States, the world will not come up with a new order. And uh, I never liked the phrase indispensable power. I, don't like, I want others to say that about us. I never liked it when we said it about ourselves. <laughs> but the truth is, we've largely played that role. The, as you learn in high school science, systems don't self-organize. Uh, systems, if anything, the natural tendency is disorder or entropy, if you want to use the high school uh, chemistry or physics word. And that's what I think we're beginning to see in the world. We're beginning to see a world of, of greater entropy. The Middle East is the most advanced in that sense of the word. But we're beginning to see elements of uh, that kind of turbulence begin to show up in parts of Asia, in uh, parts of Latin America. We've got the, the twin challenges of nationalism and populism uh, showing up, certainly, in the, uh, most of the uh, advanced uh, you know, developed uh, democracies. So I just think for, we've got lots of things afoot and we no longer have the United States playing uh, a restraining or regulating or ordering role. And you would have to be a cockeyed optimist as they used to sing on Broadway to think that all of this will just sort itself out by it itself. So I, I actually think then we're at a, you know, it's Warren used one of my favorite lines, if you're not worried, you're not paying attention. It's true, you ought to be worried. Because it's a lot of what we built up over the last 70, 75 years, it seems to me, is in some, some more than a little jeopardy. And it's not at all clear, for lots of reasons I've mentioned, for reasons I haven't mentioned, about what will, what will take, its, uh, take its place. So we are, you know, there's sometimes in most of our lives we spent reading history. Well, for better or worse, this is a time now we're living in history. And uh, that is my sense that people will look back on these years and say this is when the, the post-World War II, post-Cold War order essentially unraveled. What I don't know is exactly what's the nature of that and what it gives, what it ultimately takes its place. 
There's lots of scenarios. We can talk about what are the, uh, what are the alternatives to the order we've known. But I do think that a, a big chunk of the order we've known has, uh, has essentially uh, run its course. Uh, Richard, any chance that when people look <clears throat> back on this period in a couple of decades or a decade, or they may say that's the period where the United States wandered into war. Now, what I have in mind, and this is to uh, stay within the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the speakers here about a year and a half ago was Stephen Cook, who had written the book False Dawn about uh, oh. the Arab Spring. But Stephen uh, has a piece actually today in Foreign Policy uh, in which he says, and I copied it, and he said, he talked about what's going on now. He said, all this should remind you of the run-up to the Iraq War. And then you have Russia and Crimea, and you have China and the South China Sea. Um, how much of a danger is there that we could miscalculate, stumble into a real war situation? Look, the risk is always there. Uh, statesmanship, diplomacy matters. I recently wrote a piece in the last issue of Foreign Affairs called uh, what, How World Orders End. Uh, the parallel I found to the present was in the mid-19th century. There was a world order that was forged after the, no the settlement after the Napoleonic Wars. You had the uh, Congress of Vienna, which Henry Kissinger wrote one of the magisterial books about. It's actually, depressingly enough, his doctoral dissertation. It's a stunning piece of uh, s scholarship, a world restored about Castlereagh and Metternich and the, the diplomacy, Talleyrand, the diplomacy, and it basically set up the concert of Europe, which managed the then great power relations in Europe for quite a while. But, but by mid-century, mid particularly in Crimea, it, it began to unravel. And 50, 60 years later, you ended up with something awful called World War I. Where I think we are is not on the eve of a 21st century World War I. We're not where we were 100 years ago. But I think we are closer to where we were 150 years ago, mm -hmm. where the old order uh, had begun to more than fray at the edges and great, greater great power rivalry, regional conflicts, and it wasn't clear what was going to take its place. So I can imagine, look, I can imagine two things. One, it takes no imagination a continuation of internal conflicts, which have become the hallmark of this era. If you think about the post-Cold War era, most of the conflicts in the world have been within states, within countries. Uh, we're seeing you know, this play out to some extent in Venezuela. We saw it play out in Colombia. Uh, we've got weak states in places like Mexico and the rest who are dealing with. Obviously, we're seeing it throughout the Middle East, Libya, Syria. Uh, Yemen, so parts of Africa. So that's going to continue. It seems to me that's one of the hallmarks of the ages. But the question is whether conflict between countries makes something of a comeback. And I think that's a possibility. I can imagine any day now something between Pakistan and India. I think the idea that India will turn another cheek like it did after the Taj terrorist attacks is unlikely. And then the question is, can India and Pakistan manage to avoid escalation? I can imagine uh, the Russians either continuing to do what they're doing in Ukraine, because so far they haven't paid much of a price, or I can imagine them, Putin deciding to do something like what he's done in eastern Ukraine, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis a NATO member. I don't think that's off the, uh, off the uh, table. Or developing I, nuclear weapons that he can now do since he's free of the... Uh... He's been doing that, yeah. Been doing some of that anyhow. I could imagine uh, China, less about the South China Sea. Uh, I think the possibility of something involving Taiwan yeah, I mean, yeah, cannot I just come back from there. I don't think that can be uh, brushed, uh, brushed aside. I think Stephen's point, uh, I would be worried about Iran. I think uh, I'm less concerned now than I was two years ago about the possibility of a conflict with North Korea in part because I think to some extent we have acquiesced to North Korea's nuclear and missile program, despite the rhetoric to the contrary. But I do think the possibility for war with Iran is high. You've already got a low-level Israeli-Iranian war in Syria, where the Israelis are refusing to let Iran do in Syria what it did in Lebanon, to build up a permanent military in infrastructure. Basically, they're refusing to allow Iran to Hezbollahize uh, Syria. Uh, you've got the proxy war 
between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and to some extent a direct war in Yemen. And the question is, could you have an incident one way or another that spills uh, over? You have the fact that Iran has stayed into the, the nuclear deal, but imagine we were to get warning or intelligence that they were not. I think it would raise fundamental questions what the Israelis or Americans uh, might do. So I think there's, yeah, I think the possibility of, of interstate conflicts is much greater now than it's probably been for, 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 for decades. And I don't mean to be alarmist, but I don't think what I've just said is in the land of the far-fetched. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, um, the word you use in the book is abdication about what the United States has done with world leadership. It has abdicated its role as a world leader. Um, when Guterres became Secretary General, he put out a statement of basically warning, without naming names, great powers that would leave the world stage, that there were other great powers eager to take that space. Obviously, he was talking about the United States leaving and China stepping in. China has become much more assertive at the United Nations than before. It's now surpassed Japan as the, as the second largest um, donor. Um, uh, I can mention another Council on Foreign Relations person who has been here. Uh, Liz Economy came last June to promote her book, The Third Revolution. And I actually, I know you were with her yesterday, and so was I at another event. Um, and um, first of all, is, is China capable of becoming a world leader and doing the kinds of things that the United States was doing as a world leader? Well, to be a world leader, you have to have certain ambitions, certain capabilities, and you have to have followers. Yes, that's what I... Uh, I don't see China aspiring to that role particularly. China is still using its foreign policy more than anything else as a function of its domestic policy yeah. to strengthen the domestic political standing of its leaders uh, for trade purposes, for uh, its investment is tied to what it wants, wants to bring back uh, home, uh, access to certain facilities and so forth. In order to be a world leader, the United States, I think, well, but you can be a world leader by coercion or weight, but that's almost impossible these days. Um, the United States sir, turned out to be a very effective world leader because it was done with consent. The United States didn't, for the most part, impose its leadership on others. It basically designed it, and others were pretty happy to participate in it. People were not forced to enter into alliance relationships. Uh, people were not forced to enter into certain uh, institutions. They, they did so uh, voluntarily and gladly, and they felt that the bargain was, was pretty good for them. I don't see China thinking in those ways. Uh, I just, I don't see what China offers for most countries is, is going to be terribly attractive. Even something like Belt and Road, which is one of their first attempts at institution building, is a very narrow pro-Chinese mechanism. The terms of loan, shall we say, are extortionate. Uh, so, what the, you know, the approach to the South China Sea was to ignore legal uh, a legal ruling. I don't see them playing a significant role in ordering the Middle East or, 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 or anywhere else. I think what China would like to be is have a position of a first among equals in the Asia Pacific. And that represents a change because for a long time the Chinese were more than content with the American alliance system because among other things this was a way to manage Japan's political and military uh, rise and so forth, to manage things on the Korean Peninsula. I think China might be playing with fire in some ways about setting in motion a set of regional dynamics. It's already, you know, I think it, India's non-participation in the Belt and Road is quite clear as a, uh, as a message. I think that uh, if China ever were to move against Taiwan, and depending upon how that played out, it could have, I think, fundamental implications for Japan's uh, military and also nuclear uh, policy. We'll see how things play out on the uh, Korean Peninsula. So no, I don't see China as taking the American role. We're not going to enter an era of Chinese hegemony or primacy. I think the real alternative to an American-led world is a nobody-led world. And places, you know, China will have certain influence, in, particularly in Asia Pacific. Russia will have some in Europe. Iran, Turkey, Israel, and who knows who else will slug it out in the uh, Middle East and so forth. So uh, I see it as a, a world which is much less structured at either the global level or the regional level 
probably means it's more violent at the regional level. What worries me about the global level, much less cooperative at dealing with issues like climate or anything else. It's, it's very hard to be at it with a country in a really hostile way on Mondays, Wednesdays, you know, and Thursdays, but hope on Tuesday you can carve out a few hours to cooperate on another issue. Possible, but, but easier said than done. Uh, while you're on China, China and Russia, how is that going to develop? Or is China so much more powerful? Well, that's it. I mean, China's 10 times the population, 10 yep. times the population of, of Russia. It is, um, China's got a real economy. Russia does not. Russia basically is an oil and gas producing cash crop. China's a real economy. Uh, so I think there may be some tactical overlaps, but I don't think in the long run, strategically, they're headed in, in similar directions. I actually think China's going to hit some speed bumps, potentially. I think it's going to have some difficulties. I think their, econo their economy's slowing much more than people realize. Uh, there's signs of some pushback against the leadership. I think China's going to go through some difficult challenges, but ultimately China's going to do just fine. I think there's fundamental questions about Russia uh, in terms of succession to Mr. Putin one day. There's no concept of legitimacy there. Uh, it's cronyism. I think there's real questions about the economy, which is, not, you know, there's not a lot of economy. That's not oil and gas uh, centric. Uh, Eastern Asiatic Russia is uh, underpopulated and, and underdeveloped. And in, indeed, there's millions of Chinese essentially homesteading across the, uh, the, the border. I think Russia's going to have its uh, hands but I don't think Russia's interesting for China. It's not a big enough market. It's not a big enough uh, partner, ultimately. I think China has much, uh, in that sense, is much more interested in the ASEAN countries. You know, that's what, 800 million people. That's a real economy with some of its other Asian neighbors. But the future, a country of 100, what, 140 million, whatever Russia is, <laughs> with, uh, you know, once you take away oil and gas with a, a negligible GDP per capita, that's not real interesting for China. <clears throat> I want to ask you one more question and then turn it over to the, to the audience. Um, the audience, uh, to use a pejorative phrase in the Trump uh, White House, this is an audience I'd wager full of globalists. I bet all of these people are globalists. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have come. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the book, talking about multilateralism, which is a large subject here um, and across the street, um, you say uh, multilateralism has to be rethought and reconfigured. Just talk about that a bit, because sure. these people are practicing that art and would like to know okay. how that should be done. Uh, I still don't know what the word globalist means. Can I just say that? Uh, no, no, that, that's what Trump says. I know, I know. I'm yeah. saying so I, I don't quite know what it means. No. Uh, if, you, if it recognizes the... It means you're the enemy. If it, rec if it means you recognize the importance of global issues, fair enough. If it means you uh, recognize the importance of multilateralism, that there aren't unilateral answers to climate change, or you can't regulate the internet by yourself, or deal with infectious disease by yourself or set up a global trading order, then you know, <coughs> sign me up. Uh, I think um, it's essential. Uh, my, my view is simply that most of the arrangements we have for dealing with global challenges are inadequate. Uh, what we have on climate change is woefully inadequate. Even if we fulfilled Paris, we'd still be, uh, shall we say, in, in dangerous uh, straits. And the answer is we're, we're unlikely to. We have virtually no cyber governance. The international health regulations in many cases have been ignored by countries. So we're quite vulnerable. Uh, their global trade talks, you know, the Doha round died uh, years ago. So you, you can go through it issue by issue by issue. Globalization is So we've got to try to figure out ways of narrowing the gap between global challenges and global uh, Range. It's not a mechanical error. It's going to t answer. It's going to require politics. My view about multilateralism also, also is we need to rethink certain issues. We're, we're so conscious of sovereignty as rights and absolutes. Now, there's been a couple of exceptions to that, talking about across the street. In 2005, the idea of R2P, responsibility to protect, the idea was if you totally do not live up to the obligations of sovereignty, <coughs> The others have the, the right or even the obligation to do something to protect 
uh, innocent life. Rarely is that acted upon, but uh, it's a worthy, it's a worthy idea. My view is that with sovereignty comes not just rights, but also obligations. And by the way, the obligations are not just to others as an act of philanthropy. It's obligations to others because it's good for us. To do something about climate change is not a favor we do for others. It's a favor we also do for ourselves. To do something about infectious disease is, is the height of self-interest, even if it also means helping other countries coming up with better reporting systems and better uh, primary uh, care. To do something about internet governance, again, is, is partially a favor for ourselves because we're so re dependent and reliant on, on the internet for everything that goes on in this uh, country. So I'd like people to rethink multilateralism and not see it as, as juxtaposed against national self-interest. But in many ways, we've got, a, we've got to design it in a way that it, it, it's an extension of national self-interest. And what I, I talk about World Order 2.0 and things like that. But basically, I try to develop a, a notion where we need to see sovereignty through a prism of obligations as well as rights. And the obligations are ones that all nation states have to others. And we do it because in this web of reciprocal obligations would come about uh, a world that would uh, be better not just for the other guy, but better for, for ourselves. And that's the way I'm trying to get people to rethink multilateralism. It's not la la land, but rather it's the height of realpolitik. Multilateralism is uh, it's realism in the 21st century. And we've got to recast it as not idealism, it is realism. You have a nice phrase called sovereign self-interest illustrates that point. Um, I'm going to get some questions. You raise your hand. I'm going to call on three people at once if you can answer a then I will take notes of questions, and he will take notes. Uh, we'll start here on the left, and then right there directly in the back, and then I need a woman. There you are. Uh, Did you go to the University of Chicago? Yes, I did. Is, is it truly where fun goes to die? <laughs> no idea, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in the techno technology part of it. So, anyway, my question is: It looks uh, Trump is worried about with Mr. Putin. Mm -hmm. What do you think, if that were to be true, that? Right. What kind of a miscalculation would, would that be on behalf of either one of them? Okay. Uh, the second one, I think, was this gentleman and then the woman behind. Thank you, uh, Mr. Haas. Um, as the war in Syria is... Can you introduce oh. yourself and tell you who, you who you are? Hi, my name is Alex. I'm a reporter with the Tokyo Shimbun, a Japanese newspaper. Welcome. As the war in Syria is uh, winding down, uh, countries like the United States, countries in Europe, countries in the Middle East, even Russia and China, can be expecting a large influx of returning foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, can this pose a destabilizing factor for some countries? And how should countries deal with this large influx of returning foreign terrorist fighters? Thank you. And then the woman right there. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I was pointing. Oh. Very good. Yeah, I'll, I was I'll pointing at here. somebody else. <laughs> we'll get you the next round. There'll be a, there'll be a future round. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Noreen Fink, I'm with the UK mission to the UN where I focus on counterterrorism. But you mentioned that in a world where the US isn't leading, there's a risk that no one leads. And we see almost a return to a kind of anarchical society, almost, it sounds like. Um, in this neighborhood, it does sometimes feel like in the last couple of years, um, there's a vacuum in terms of the soft power that the U.S. used to be able to wield in this neighborhood. Um, do you think that's repairable in the next few years, or do you think that what has taken 70 years to build up uh -huh. may be um, lost and no longer recoverable? Thank you. Okay, take those three. Take those three. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the first one about Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin. I can't explain the, uh, the nature of the relationship. Uh, People always ask me what is motivating it. I have no idea. Uh, I, I find it hard to justify the president's approach to Russia on strategic grounds. I'd say aspects of the administration policy towards Russia, though, are much more robust. If one looks at sanctions, unlike the previous administration, this one chose to uh, provide serious arms to Ukraine. 
So, you know, to the, there's almost two policies at times, the president's policy towards Russia and the administration's policy towards, uh, uh, towards Russia. But I, I can't explain uh, what motivates the president, but I do think there's a real danger that it will lead Mr. Putin, who's quite a, I think, quite a good tactician. He's, he's played a weak hand very well. You look at Ukraine, you look at Georgia, you look at Syria. For relatively modest, I guess here we are in New York, it's the financial center of the world. He's gotten a really good ROI, return on investment, for what he's uh, done. And my hunch is he's always looking for opportunities to do more, particularly because he's got real problems at home. So the idea that foreign policy becomes something of a safety valve for him is uh, not inconceivable. In terms of you know, returning terrorists, well, look, in some cases, terrorists don't return anywhere. They fade into the local populations. We saw that in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, some may stay in Syria. I don't think they necessarily leave. Uh, my hunch is Syria is likely to be at war with itself to some extent for a long time to come. Some may end up in uh, Yemen. Some may end up uh, elsewhere. But what countries, you know, we have to think about the routes they might use if they do choose to go home. And that's where... Turkey will become important, and up to now it's been quite disappointing. And then that's why it's important for countries to have powerful, you know, you do need homeland security and you need border controls and the rest. Uh, no one in his right mind argues for, you know, open borders if that means anyone can come in as they, uh, as they uh, please. But my, my guess is, though, a lot of these people will stay where they are for some time to... Uh, to come. Ms. Fink's question, um, interesting, you used the phrase anarchical society. That's the title of my favorite book uh, in the field. It was written by an Australian academic, Hedley Bull. And uh, the words are a bit of an oxymoron because anarchy by definition is what it is. Society implies rules and structures and regulation. And what he argued is at any one moment in history, the balance between anarchy and society is what, is what gives you a snapshot of the world at that, at that moment. And I would simply say the balance, we're not an anarchy now by any means, but the balance between society and anarchy is moving in the wrong direction. And the trend is what worries me. Because, uh, again, if I compare where we are now to 10 or 20 years ago, I don't like it. And again, my, my view is simply that uh, it won't correct itself. Look, soft power depends upon everything from the nature of our diplomacy to the, the image we send of American society. I think an important part of American soft power is the uh, strength of our economy. So we took a major hit with the 2007-8 financial crisis. I think it's uh, how, we, how well we deal with social pressures, whether it was uh, civil rights back when or uh, opportunities for women and others uh, now. How well Washington functions makes a... Uh, has a real uh, impression. So I think American soft power has taken a real hit. Is to some extent it recoverable? Sure. I think it, I think it is recoverable. What I think is more difficult to recover uh, will be America's reputation for reliability. I think in the back of people's minds, and this is what worries me, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I think about it, is if it could happen once, could it happen again? So some people out there will think that. Second of all, even if Mr. Trump is a one-term president, I don't think that what you might call Trumpism ends with him. He is, to some extent, a reflection and not just a cause of some of Think about the last election. What did Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump have in common? All three opposed the Trans-Pacific Partnership. <laughs> that said something about where the public was and the politics of free trade uh, were. If you read uh, in our magazine, Foreign Affairs, what Elizabeth Warren wrote two or three issues ago, you know, her, her view on a lot of areas is, well, bring the troops back home, including Iraq and Afghanistan. So the difference is there. We'll see what the Democratic candidates, all 73 of them, uh, say <laughs> about foreign policy. But it's quite possible in many areas that there might be more overlap between many of the candidates and the current administration. Yeah, some of the, the language will be different. You can sandpaper off some of the confrontational edges. But my sense is a lot of people on both sides of the political spectrum basically buy into the idea that we've done too much out there and not enough uh, here at uh, home. So you just say one other thing also about American soft power. I think there's very different scenarios 
in terms of our soft power if, if Donald Trump is a, a one-term president as opposed to a two-term president. If he's a one-term president and succeeded by a Democrat who's from the center, you know, the Biden-Bloomberg sort of part of the political spectrum, or if he's a one-term president and succeeded by someone who's much more quote-unquote progressive. And I think those will have different implications for American foreign policy and for how America is judged in the world. Excellent. Um, right there, I, I, and Matthew, and then here in the front row. Thank you. Uh, Joanna Meyer, thank you very much. Thank you always to IPI. I have two questions. One is about uh, Saudi Arabia. Recently, we learned that the current administration was trying to circumvent some kind of uh, regulations on uh, nuclear exchange. And you mentioned earlier, I, I don't, I can't quote you exactly, but you said that the that uh, Saudi Arabia is withdrawing from the relationship. That doesn't seem to me like we're withdrawing. Uh, anyway, I'll leave that. That's the first question. What, what are your thoughts on this? And also, I follow the entire continent of Africa, and it seems to me that China has much more in, in uh, engagement, investment in uh, the Belt and Road and in uh, economic cooperation. In, in my view, the U.S. is totally neglecting Africa. I, I follow every kind of, you know, uh, extractive industries, everything, counterterrorism. But uh, I think that's a gaffe on the part of the United States. And um, I, I, I don't know got what it. else to say about that. But, uh, but, it, but it... I got it. I, I, I'm yeah, going to okay, cut you off. Thanks. Just, yeah, got another one. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. I guess since we're here, I wanted to ask you about the UN. What do you think of the UN's both relevance or possible abdication? And on things, on, on you know, issues as possibly soluble as Cameroon, I see them not doing much. But I, you'd mentioned Venezuela. So I wanted to, when the, when the council had its meeting on a Saturday, an urgent meeting, the Secretary General didn't come. Uh, he stayed in his residence. And I think, I think some people think maybe he didn't come because he didn't want to either anger the American side or the Russian Chinese side. And Marco Rubio has said that this is a quote, this is one of the few senators actually speaking about Antonio Guterres. He said that he played directly into Maduro's hands and that the UN is useless. So I'm wondering, I just want to get, I guess, your thoughts of how this US process uh, interacts with the UN. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. I I'm also a member of the council, thanks to Warren, so it's a very small world. Um, anyway, um, I'm, to get you back Evelyn to what- Evelyn, introduce yourself, sorry. Evelyn, introduce thank you. yourself. Oh, Evelyn Leopold, UN correspondent. That's just for the webcast, so they know. Absolutely. We all know. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Mr. Haas, I want you to go back to Western Europe. It seems to me that Putin and Trump align on many issues, not all, but many. There is not a neo-fascist that they can avoid. They love the, the alt-right in Brexit. They love the alt-right in Austria, uh, the Freiheit's party. They love the, um, the Liga in Italy, which is putting up Benito calendars these days. Uh, I could name some more, but I just wonder what you think of that. Okay. And secondly, on the Middle East, considering that uh, MBS has shown himself to be erratically impulsive, a bit like our president, can this possibly work? Because Kushner is not as crazy as, as, okay. as MBS is. Got it. Well, I always like to call on journalists, but they always, they always ask two questions instead of so one. So our three questions became five questions. Uh, the, uh, I got it. Saudi Arabia and nuclear weapons. Why in the world we would want well, not nucle nuclear react? Why in the world we would want to provide Saudi Arabia nuclear materials, equipment, what have you, without total safeguards, protections, and the like is beyond me. Why we might want to provide it even with all those things is not uh, immediately obvious uh, to me. The threat that they would go to China and Russia is not a threat I would uh, accept if I were in the administration. I would make it clear that if they were to do that, it would have all sorts of implications for their relationship with us. And I would simply say, particularly this Saudi Arabia, and I'm sad to say this because I've worked with the Saudis for decades. I was President Bush the father's Middle East guy at the White House. The, uh, 
There's if one looks at Khashoggi, one looks at Yemen, one looks at Qatar, one looks at Lebanon, one could go around the region. Uh, the, I, it, it's hard to feel confident in the uh, decision-making process there. So, no, uh, I hope this, any thought of this transfer stops. Uh, that's, that's a simple thing for me. Uh, in terms of ch Africa, yeah, the United States is neglecting it. And we, were, we had tremendous standing in Africa. I think, I know a lot of people are critical of the 43rd president, George W. Bush. I think one of the real, you know, so where some of the real strengths of his presidency were in Africa, dealing on uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, PEPFARs, and so forth. Interesting, you know, there were some very funny stories in the press that when, uh, when Barack Obama went to Africa, he was surprised by how positive uh, his predecessor was, uh, was uh, thought to be by many uh, people. But yeah, look, we pay, we're not, you know, there's aid, but also there's trade, immigration policies. And yeah, we're not, Africa's not getting a lot of it, uh, attention and we're, we, we don't have the tools or we're not giving ourselves the tools. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's short sighted. What can I tell you? In terms of the UN, no, I don't think the UN, look, I think it's important to separate the Security Council versus the uh, other parts of the UN. In terms of the Security Council, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Richard Holbrook or somebody else, who basically said, you know, blaming the Security Council, I think it was the time for the inability to do anything about, it might have been the Balkans or something, it's like blaming Madison Square Garden for the Knicks. Uh, the Security Council is never more or less than the major powers with the veto want it to be. We're in the era where the major powers agree on very little. So the Security Council is not going to be terribly useful. I think we just have to accept that. Um, that's going to mean finding other coalitions of the willing, other ways of working issues outside of the uh, Security Council, whether it's Venezuela or anything else. I mean, I would, the only hope in Venezuela, and, and if, if there is a consensus, then the Security Council could be useful. I could imagine two scenarios. One is where China and Russia come to understand that their investment in Mr. Maduro is really short-sighted, and they decide that they have to build relationships with Mr. Guaido and with the opposition, <laughs> Or if and when, hopefully sooner rather than later, Mr. Maduro is gone, then there's going to be a massive rebuilding effort that needs to be done in Venezuela, and quite possibly then. The UN could be helpful. If not, it'll be the Americans, Latins, Europeans. And then, and then I'd like to see, let's see if the Chinese and others will do things, uh, whether they will step up to the, uh, to the moment. But, but by and large, again, the UN is, uh, it was never meant to be used. Go back to when it was designed. The UN was never designed to be an institution used by one major power against another. That's why the five were given vetoes. So we shouldn't be surprised when they disagree the UN's not effective. It was never was meant to be. It's meant to be a talk shop in those cases. To me, the real challenge for the UN is to focus on the parts of the UN that the UN controls. And that's things like peacekeeping and the rest. And build up real capability that's not corrupt, that doesn't do violence to the people it's meant to protect, particularly women and, and girls. Let's improve that. Let's improve the ability of the UN to deliver services. Let's do something about the spoil system, about the corruption, about the incompetence. That's what the UN has real control over. That's not, can't blame that one so easily on the great powers. So that's what I would uh, focus on. I realize it's dangerous to say this sitting across the street, but there you have it. Uh, won't be invited back, will I, Warren? Uh, Europe. I actually think the bigger threat to Europe right now, or at least a bigger threat is whatever Mr. Putin is doing and whatever Mr. Trump is doing is what the Europeans are doing to themselves. Brexit is, to me, the ultimate own goal. It is a short-sighted act of a political and economic folly that is, a, it's a real head shaker is all I can say. It's, it's just irresponsibility on steroids in my uh, modest or immodest uh, opinion. And I do think if it goes ahead in a hard way, I, I do think it will lead, among other things, to the end of the United Kingdom, as we know it. I think, Scotland, right? I think Northern Ireland and Scotland. Yeah. I think it will set both dynamics in motion. Now, what I don't know, again, it's too soon to say that will happen. My hunch is like, if you can't get an agreement between the Prime Minister and Brussels that enough people will buy into, you'll probably get a delay. So I think people will kick the can down there. I don't know how it's going to play out or when it's going to play out. but. I have a view that life is tough enough, and to have introduced Brexit uh, into it to me is just stunning. But when you look around Europe beyond Brexit, you look at um, both right-wing 
populism, in part because, you know, large part because of immigration, real or imagined concerns. You look at the, the left-wing uh, examples of it. You see what's happening in France, where you actually have both. It's Italy, you have both. The difference is in Italy, it's in government. In, Paris, in France, it's out of uh, government. But right now, I think the, the, the European project was one of the two great pieces of post-World War II statecraft. There was NATO, there was, and then there was the European project, the coal and steel community, the European community, ultimately, ultimately the European Union. I actually think the, the European project is, uh, to use my favorite word, is at best it's in disarray, at worst it's in jeopardy. Um, people, it's easy to get frustrated over what it is and isn't, but people should not overlook what its contribution has been to both peace and prosperity and democracy. And I worry about the future of the, uh, of the European uh, project. Last but not least, I knew it would be impossible to get away with the meeting without talking about Israeli-Palestinian issues. Uh, try as I uh, might. The first thing to say is to me how uncentral it is to the Middle East. Imagine tomorrow there was a solution to that problem, two Palestinian states, whatever. Does anyone think Syria, Libya, Yemen, whatever would be better? Answer, no. So it's no longer, in that sense, central to the future of this uh, part of it. It's important mainly for itself. It's important for the future of Israel, the, I mean, whether Israel remains a secure, prosperous, Jewish, democratic uh, country. It's obviously important to the Palestinians, what kind of a life uh, they have. But I don't think it's particularly important to the uh, region. That said, I think where it is, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and where right now it's heading is not good for anybody. I think it's one of those situations that nobody uh, benefits. My own view is a two-state solution is the worst except for all the others. Uh, so I think that uh, it is uh, where I disagree with the administration. I'd love to be proven wrong. Good news is I guess I'm wrong frequently. Is the what they what they're fashioning? I would call an outside-in approach. They seem to be thinking that if they can get the Saudis and others on board, that will create a, a construct in which peace will then come. That Palestinians will and Israelis will have uh, either in the negative sense, no choice but to make peace, or more positively, we'll have the confidence to make peace. I just don't see it. I actually think peace is, is only going to happen from the inside out, if it happens. Uh, given the dynamics in Israel, though we'll see what happens in the election, given the splits within the Palestinian uh, community, or lack of community. So again, uh, I just don't, I've been skeptical of this approach. I'd love to be proven wrong. Uh, at some point, we're going to have the administration, I think, not come forward with a plan so much as a set of ideas, principles, concepts, whatever you want to uh, call it. But uh, I, uh, I once wrote a book 10 books ago about ripeness, R-I-P-E-N-E-S-S, -S, and I basically said, in order for any of these agreements, and I failed at many, I was the U.S. envoy for Cyprus. That didn't work out so good. I, I was the U.S. envoy for Northern Ireland. I've been involved in Middle East and Indo-Pakistani peacemaking. You know, for any of these things to work, the formula is important, but it's not the most important thing. What you really need are leaders who are willing and able to make peace. Two things, willing and able. And I just don't see it in the Middle East in terms of Israelis and Palestinians. I don't. South Africa, apartheid ended when it did and how it did, not simply because of Nelson Mandela, as remarkable a human being as it was. Nelson Mandela had the really good luck to have F.W. de Klerk in power at the same time. It took two of them to do it. And what you don't have in the Middle East, what I can see, are people on both sides. And at times, I think, you know, more often than not, you've had Israelis who are willing to do it, and you haven't had a Palestinian counterpart. At the moment, you may not have either. So I just, uh, I just don't see it uh, happening, and I don't think... People tend to exaggerate what outsiders can do. I think outsiders can provide the missing 5 or 10%. But the locals have to do the bulk of the running. And I just don't think you have locals on the ground in the Israeli and Palestinian sides right now who are willing and able to make the kinds of decisions they would have to make and then who could sell them to their respective political constituencies. Because that's, that's where the able part comes in. You've got to be willing to do it, and then you've got to be willing to sell it to your own base and make it stick. And I just don't see those preconditions or prerequisites being met right now on the Israeli-Palestinian thing. And I, I hope I'm wrong. 
because this is not one of those situations where the options get better with time. Uh, it's not, this is not like a great bottle of Bordeaux. And you put it down for 10 or 20 years and you come back to it and it's better. That is not the Middle East. Uh, as we've seen with every year that goes by, I actually think the things, the tools, the, what, what diplomats have to work with actually is, is getting smaller rather than greater. And I don't know when we pass a, a tipping point, but again, time is not, time, time is not our friend here. Did you want to ask? I have a bias towards journalists. So I, don't I got know. Jonathan? Well, actually, we'll just go one, two, three. Okay. Well, that'll be, we got to make that the last batch. Is that okay? That's right. We can make that the last batch. <laughs> this will be the last, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I got my Hi, eye. Jonathan Grano from the President of the Global Security Institute, and I represent the summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates at the UN. From the end of World War II, after the Four Freedoms... That's why I've never heard from you. Yeah. <laughs> Hold it up. Oh, I... Uh, at, from the world, end of World War II, after the Four Freedoms speech, until the Trump administration, certain principles were a compelling magnet of global order, the rule of law, the reliance on empiricism, the principle that all lives are equal, the legitimacy of government being legitimated by those who are governed. Those core principles have now been abrogated by the United States. What principles, I'm not talking about real politic power, but what principles do you see emerging that might be a, other than those, because I don't, I don't want any other than those, I like those. What principles do you see emerging that might be compelling in the future? And give the microphone to the woman right next to you. Thank you, Carmen Jones, a former political affairs officer at the UN, 15 years. I'm, I would like to refer to uh, the gentleman's comment on China and the idea of leadership. Not to diminish the role of politics or political ideas, but given the depth and scope of Chinese investment in Africa, one would think that perhaps it's not looking for uh, overt leadership, but it is influential. I mean, for example, a country that uh, China builds the presidential palace of an African country, I mean, it's not leadership at all, but it's a huge influence. I worked for the Wall Street Journal for 18 months before joining the UN, and the main takeaway, as I say these days, was that the, uh, the search for the margin of profits rules the world, really, in this world and the next, maybe. So perhaps we should redefine leadership as, as uh, the search for influence by other means, not political ideas, but investments at that, uh, at that level. Okay. This is a comment. I promised Richard he could get out by 7.30, so third question, and third and last question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Ian Johnson, Interim Dean at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I want to ask you a question about a term that you've used in the past and may even have coined, ad hoc multilateralism. And uh, to, to make sure this isn't treated as a softball question, I'll ask it in a slightly provocative way. Mm -hmm. Is that um, ad hoc multilateralism, is that still an approach you would advocate? And isn't there a risk that that will destroy the multilateral institutions that you've talked about, the UN and the World Trade Organization and the World Bank and NATO, et cetera? OK. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer the first two questions. Um, I don't think the United States is putting forward a clear set of alternative principles or norms about what ought to inform uh, order. I think Mr. Trump's bias is more towards disrupting the existing uh, order, towards moving away from institutions and relationships more towards transactions. Uh, but I haven't heard uh, an articulation in that sense of something that's a, a, a vision. And I don't think many of his predecessors did very well either. I think that with the end of the Cold War, we haven't been very good at articulating an American approach to, uh, to world order. Because my view is, um, again, could be wrong here, but the goal can't just be to maintain the post-World War II order, because my whole argument is that's inadequate. So even if it were more robust than it is, it's still inadequate. It was never meant to deal with a world with 190 countries, with China where it is, with climate change, with cyber and the rest. So we need to modernize the world order. Uh, and I don't see us having articulated an approach to it. And sovereign, a narrow definition of sovereignty, 
which is this administration's default option, seems to me inadequate. Again, the answer is not to be against sovereignty, but it's basically to say, how do you square sovereignty and multilateralism in a way that's consistent or buttresses our self-interest? That's the intellectual challenge, and I don't see us stepping up to it. Uh, I got my views, but uh, you know, I'm sitting a few blocks from here and uh, writing books. Um, in terms of China, look, yes, I think your, China has influence, is not exerting leadership in many of that, but I, I'd say towards what end? And my frustration with too much Chinese, with a lot of Chinese foreign policy, is that the principal end of Chinese foreign policy still seems to be to promote the strength of the party, the strength of the economy. It's a China centric, it's very narrow. And in order to lead in the world, I think you need something larger. And I don't see China having made that transition. Indeed, it still insists in many cases it's treated as a developing country. Come on, it's the world's second largest economy, get real. Step up to some responsibility. Uh, but there's still a narrowness to China's, uh, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, because as their economy slows, as there's a bit of domestic uh, friction, if anything, I think the Chinese are going to get more preoccupied with maintaining domestic uh, order and a trajectory that's consistent with the current political arrangements. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of Chinese leadership, though you might see greater Chinese assertiveness and specific claims to, uh, to influence. Ad hoc, ad hoc multilateralism. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I use phrases like that. I think uh, I've also, coalitions of the willing, that's another one of mine. Uh, others have used the phrase designer multilateralism. I, look, I think it's a recognition of a couple of things. And it's not all bad. One is simply that the formal institutions of multilateralism are ossified. Again, we talked about the Security Council. So if you're going to assume that the Security Council is the be all and end all, wow. I mean, so sometimes you've got to do end runs. We did an end runs during the Balkans crisis through NATO. And I think that worked pretty well. In other cases, you've got to form coalitions of the willing to deal with specific challenges. I mean, on trade, essentially we said, okay, the Doha round hit a wall. Okay, but then you can do things like TPP. I think we made a strategic and economic error to do what we did by dropping out of it, but you can do that, or you could do what was NAFTA that became the USMCA. And, those, and then what's good about them is they, first of all, they, they're significant. If you can get a significant you know, number of players that have real weight, that's meaningful. Second of all, they become real laboratories. It's interesting that TPP became something of a laboratory for a new generation of trade ideas. Where did the USMCA get a lot of its content from? The terrible TPP agreement. And that became a sort of laboratory of uh, a trade. On climate, one approach is Paris, I get that, and I think Paris is a perfect example, by the way, of trying to square multilateralism and, and sovereignty, because countries essentially decide what they're going to sign, sign up to. So I think that's quite was quite clever. And I, for the life of me, cannot understand why the administration got out of a multilateral agreement that protected sovereignty. This ought to have them been their model international agreement. Not, uh, not something, but put that... Uh, but another way to think about it was maybe it would have been enough to say to get a more ambitious agreement with the 15 major emitters. So because the last 175 countries only got you another 15%. Is it worth doing that? Uh, for, Latin, for Venezuela, it might be that you work with the Lima Group or a few others and you put together, particularly afterwards, a kind of friends of Venezuela. So if the, you, don't do, you don't go through formal multilateralism in the, in the OAS because the Cubans will be useless and we'll block it, wherever you have consensus as a prerequisite. No. So you basically, this Mexican government's playing an exceedingly unhelpful and disappointing role. So what you do is you fashion a group. What you want to get are, are groups that are like-minded and have something to bring to the party. Now, is it as good? Would I rather have a security council or 193 countries in the General Assembly march in the same direction to do something? Absolutely. But if you can't get that, and on most issues you won't get it, the choice can't become inaction versus the perfect multilateralism. So my view is you get the best multilateralism you can get, and wherever you can expand it, wherever you can institutionalize it, you do. But that, uh, you, you build the multi, you, again, you, if it beca you can't make it all or nothing. You get what you can and where you can perhaps over time expand it or institutionalize it, fantastic. And there's a certain history, by the way, where that happened. Some of the non-proliferation efforts began ad hoc and over time became uh, more formal. I can imagine certain cyber rules of the road 
coming out of some like-minded countries. We develop it, and then over time, that could be perhaps built, you could build some norms there, and maybe that could become the basis for something uh, more ambitious. So to me, this is, a, this is a kind of pragmatic, from the ground up, multilateral. It's not, it's not better than the other. It's not an alternative to the other, but often it's the best and only game in town for the time being. And I think then you're better to go with it rather than, uh, in that case, you know, the, the best or the ideal becomes the enemy of the possible. And that, that doesn't help us. Richard, I like the tradition that every time you write a book, uh, and you've done it three times now, in my experience here, you then come to IVI to talk to people about it. It's always rich, enriching to have you here. I promised you to get out by 730 we can stay here a while longer. Richard is walking out on a lot of wine, <laughs> uh, so we can drink it in his absence. Not with a lot of wine. Yeah. Yeah. But you, Gloria, thank you, Richard. We're thank you all. Glad you. Thank you.